All right, so welcome everybody. Welcome to this lecture. My name is Kayvon. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make the presentation a little bigger and kill some of this background music real quick for everybody. So hopefully the crowd murmur is, is gone now and you can hear me okay? Great, okay. So, so welcome to this lecture. Hi, I'm Kayvon. I am sitting here in Redwood City, California right now in my home office that looks a little bit like this where I did all my teaching during the, the pandemic and things like that. Um, thank you very much for coming today. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna give a straight up first major technical lecture of Stanford's parallel computing course, which I teach. Um, and uh, hopefully it provides some value to all of you that might be interested in parallel computing. You're also doing me a huge favor in that I'm just kind of doing a dry run in this virtual classroom to get feedback from all of you, as well as to get some practice lecturing uh, virtually on a new platform. Okay, so, so first of all, welcome to the classroom. Uh, many of you have probably not been in an OEA experience just yet, so I wanted to point out a few things. So, so first of all, you are all off screen. So all of you cannot be seen or heard. It's kind of like a webinar. So by default, you're off screen. But there's this little button down here at the bottom called step to the mic. So maybe a few of you might want to try clicking on that and you will be seen and heard. So if you click step to the mic, it is like coming to the mic, you appear on screen. David, my TA, just did that. Uh, and David's muted right now, but David, could you unmute and say something? Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, you can hear me now. Right, okay, so thanks, David. And then you can click, you know, leave the mic. So that's how you can communicate with me if you wanna ask a question with audio or video. Now that said, there's a lot of us here and many of you will probably prefer to keep your video off so there are a lot of different ways you can interact with me. So some of you have figured out that there's a, a chat box here on the left, as well as a question board on uh, above it. So you can always ask a question. This is a question and folks can upvote and downvote that. David will be monitoring the chat and the questions in case I miss anything and he might interrupt me if anybody asks a really good question. Okay, so you can upvote questions to indicate your interest. Now, the other thing you can do is as I'm talking, you can be reacting with these emojis at the bottom and believe it or not is incredibly helper, helpful as a speaker to get a sense of what's going on in the classroom. So I encourage you to use them. I encourage you to use them for sort of, you know, work purposes. It will start getting distracting for folks. And, and some of you have figured out that some of them uh, have audio reactions. And I'm gonna turn that off if it gets uh, a little bit uh, distracting, okay? In fact, I might go ahead and turn off the, uh, the applause right now if it's too much. We also, you can choose custom emojis. Like if you wanna support Stanford, you might do something like this. Or also I've configured all my stuff to be emojis for a little bit more uh, 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 expressivity. Now what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm gonna just very, very briefly turn that off because I think the, the, the loud applause will just be too tempting for most people. Um, so we're gonna get too much of it. So give me one second. Um, And all right, we're back. Okay, so you can give me feedback via these reactions. And that's, that's about it. So I really encourage you to be involved in this lecture. It makes the lecture better for everybody. It makes it a lot easier as I'm lecturing to everybody else if I get a sense of how the classroom's going. All right, sound good? Okay, so first of all, I think it's pretty cool that all of you are attending this lecture from wherever the heck you are. And so I'd like to know a little bit about where everybody's coming from. So I'm gonna pop up a map here. Um, and what you can do, see this little pointer right here? You can click on this map, uh, this pointer, and then drop a pin where you are. So I just like to get a sense of where everybody is in the world here today. Looks like a lot of people are, so we have, I'm assuming we're gonna have a lot of San Francisco Bay Area, maybe a lot of folks up in Boston. Looks like we have a number of folks in India, Europe. Oh, we have a South Africa, one Brazil. Go ahead and fill this in for me. I'm just really, really curious. We also have my cat. So I'm sort of curious about who's the, the farthest person from me. So, oh, so we have someone from Australia. If someone from Australia wouldn't mind stepping to the mic and introducing yourself, that would be really cool because I think you're the farthest person from me in this lecture. 
Can we get you to come online? No? All right, never mind. So how about some of the folks from, uh, from India, actually? I'd like to see someone from India here. You can click the step to the mic. Hey, Nikhil, nice to meet you. Your camera is currently off, but if you wanted to say hello and uh, where you're attending from and what you might want to hope yeah, to hi. learn today. Yeah, so I'm uh, Nikhil, I'm attending from Pune. Uh, nice. Yeah. Very nice to meet I'm you, Nikhil. I'm from UFP in Canada, actually. I've been working remotely since the past year. Very cool, very cool. How about somebody from South America? Is there anybody from South America that would like to step to the mic and say hi? Oh, the South Americans are shot. Oh, cool. Arthur. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Arthur. Um, greetings from Brazil. <laughs> oh, nice. Good, to, good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, let's see. Who else do we have? Oh, we've got someone from South Africa. Or anybody in Europe today or China want to just step to the mic, say hello to everybody? How about someone from Berkeley? Berkeley is a foreign country. Hi, Philip. How are you? Hi, uh, I'm Philip. I'm from Germany. And yeah, I really look forward to this lecture. Right, thanks, Philip. Thanks for stepping in there. Anyone else want to say hi? Felipe? Yeah, yes, I'm Philip. I'm from Africa, Angola. But right now, I'm doing my master's degree in Russia. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Right on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's, I want some folks interacting today. And one thing we're going to do is I would like to hear more, uh, or I would like all of you to introduce yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send everybody to breakouts. You're going to turn your mic on. You're going to talk to two or three other people. And I'd like you just to introduce yourself. Just say where you're coming from. What's one thing you want to learn today? And, and something completely trivial, like if you, have, if you had one more meal in your life, what food would you want to eat? Okay. Just when you get, I want everybody to get to know each other because there's going to be various points in this lecture where I break you out, and this is the group that you're going to be in during those breakouts. So I'm going to start this breakout, and let's just keep this to like maybe two minutes or so. Introduce yourself to your peers because you're going to be doing some problem solving about parallel problems together. Of course, if you don't feel comfortable turning on your mic, no pressure at all. But it would be great if you could turn on your audio to interact with everybody else. So let's, let's see if this works. OK. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Are we back in, in the auditorium? You've met a, few, met a few friends. All right. So now that you know, we've kind of you know, met each other, those are some folks you might be working with later today. Let's go ahead and get started here on some of the technical meat. So, Here's what we're talking about today. Today, we're going to talk about computer architecture. We're going to talk about computer architecture from the perspective of someone that writes software. So someone like me who's trying to write code that runs fast on modern parallel systems. We're going to talk about key concepts about how modern parallel processors work. Some are about parallelism. Some are about memory. And these, kind of, these basics hopefully are going to help you write better code, choose what algorithms are good fits for these platforms, and for some of you that are interested in hardware, it might be a good introduction uh, for uh, some basic hardware principles. Now, one disclaimer. Today's lecture is like the first lecture in a parallel computing class. And we're going to focus on the techniques that are used heavily in fairly general purpose processors, like CPUs, GPUs, uh, maybe some embedded DSPs. And one of the biggest trends in computing right now is the shift away from some of these types of processors two more uh, specialized accelerators, like machine learning accelerators, or graphics processors, or audio and video. We're not going to talk about that today. Perhaps maybe we'll get together at some later time and, and talk about that uh, if this goes well. OK. So over the next hour, we're probably going to go from the simplest question about computing, such as what is a computer program, to some topics that typically are introduced in graduate level computing courses. So let's get started. What is a computer program? If somebody came up to you on the street and says, what is a computer program, what would your answer be? A sequence of instructions that manipulate some data, a set of statements. OK. Any other answers? A sequence of operations operating on data <laughs> ones and zeros. So. 
Yeah, so, so for some of you, you might say, well, if I said, what is a computer program? You might say, here, here's a piece of C code. So, you know, quick check for some of you that are, uh, you know, getting, wanting to warm up. What does this code do? It's a for loop, seems to double a number every time. It's exponential. Yeah, it is. It computes two to the, end, two to the 10. Basically, it computes 1,024. Now, for many of us that write software, this is kind of what we think about as a program. It's uh, some code and maybe some high-level language. Maybe some of you are more familiar with Python instead of C. But from the purposes of this lecture, we're going to think about a program from the hardware's perspective. And if you take this piece of C code and you compile it, you're going to get out a sequence of instructions like this. These are some x86 instructions as an example. Okay? So I want you to think about a program as, a, as just a list of instructions. You know, kind of like you know, the list of instructions that I was reading last night making one of my favorite meals. You know, in this case, it was carne asada. And so it just gives me a set of things to do. And I need to do one of those operations and then the other and so on and so on. Now, continuing the review for a second here, if a program is a list of instructions, what does a processor do? If somebody came up to you on the street and you had to give the most simple explanation of what a computer processor does, what would you say? It executes instructions. What does it mean to execute an instruction? What does executing an instruction do? This computation translates instructions to hardware commands, loads, stores, etc. Good, good. But let me set the stage a little bit for the rest of um, the explanations I'm going to get. So I've introduced a processor here. And again, if this is too, too simple for you, don't worry about it. We're going to get more sophisticated very fast. And if this is new to you, that's great. We're setting the stage. Is here's my simple processor. It has three pieces to it. There's one piece that I'm going to color an orange box. And its goal is to determine what instruction to do next in this sequence. We've got a yellow box that actually performs the operation described by the instruction, like an add or a multiply. And I've got a blue box that holds state of the program. So these operations have to manipulate values. And the execution context is the location of all that state. So you may want to think about that execution context just as a set of registers. Okay. So an, uh, an instruction run by a machine says, read the contents of the state. Like in this case, an add instruction says, read the contents of R0 and R1, which might be integers in this case. So R0 has the value 32, R1 has the value 64. Perform the operation, and then put the result back into state. So that uh, <clears throat> the, now the state of the program has now been updated. So the result is that R0 has now just changed to 96. Okay. So this is an example of one instruction. It performs an operation and adds two numbers. And the result of that operation is state changed in the processor. And throughout this lecture, I'm going to have orange for instruction process, for instruction decode, figuring out what instruction to do next. That's control. I'm going to have yellow for uh, execution units or ALUs that actually do real computation. I'm going to have blue to represent execution context. So what my simple processor is going to do, given a list of instructions, is just going to run one instruction after another. Every single time, it, uh, every clock, every time the processor is going to take the next step, it's going to figure out what the next instruction needs to be and then perform that operation. So that's sort of our, our little background to get everybody on the same page. What is a computer program? It's a list of instructions. What is an instruction? Describes an operation to perform and executing instructions modifies the computer's state. And what do I mean by state? I'm talking about the values of program data, like that stored in registers or in memory. Okay. All right. So any questions at this point before we start talking about parallelism? I'll pause periodically throughout the lecture in case the. OK, so let's keep going. So let's consider this really, really simple piece of code. I'm actually just, you can think about x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Not going to talk about threads just yet. 
So this thing compiles to a five instruction program. If you look carefully at this, if you assume that our register R0 contains the, the program value X, R1 is Y and R2 is Z, you confirm to yourself that yeah, this sequence of five instructions multiplies X times X, Y times Y, Z times Z, and then adds those products together. Can you see that? Everybody give me a thumbs up if that's true. Thumbs down, okay, great. Sounds like everybody's, can see that, okay. So this program has five instructions. Can we do better than taking five units of time, five steps to run this program? Okay, so some folks are starting to add some, so there's some thumbs up. Some Radisol points out that there are some operations here are, that are independent, and that's pretty important. So let's take a look at this, and I need two volunteers to help me. Can two of you step to the mic? So we have Joshua and Mohammed. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do, Joshua, I'm going to make you volunteer one. And uh, Mohammed, I'm going to make you volunteer two. Thanks for being a great volunteer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you uh, the various instructions here in yellow, okay? And underneath you is what each of you can are doing at a particular point in time. Now, those of you that are in the audience, I didn't put any ACLs on this, so you, you're able to drag things, but I want Joshua and Mohammed to do the dragging. So let's see if we just pack these, these instructions into what each of you are supposed to do. How fast can you make this program finish in? Okay, so, so first, okay, keep going. Yeah, keep going. I'll let you think about it a little bit. So for those in the audience, I will notice that at the same time, Mohammed and Joshua are basically computing x squared and y squared. Is that correct? And then Mohammed decided to do z squared. So where, where can we put this fourth instruction? Oh, there's no ads. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I see why am I so confused. <laughs> yeah, there's supposed to be ads. There's supposed to be some ads, but hold on. I can hot edit this. This is an ad. And this is an ad. There we go. Now you have some ads. <laughs> I was wondering why there was such a confusion there. OK, great. So we could do this ad of R1 after we, we do the first one. There we go. OK, great. So, so we've done this five instruction program in three cycles now, right? Awesome, you, Joshua and Mohammed have paralyzed our first program. But what happens if like, we actually had three volunteers? I'll jump in here to help out. Could we have done any better? We definitely could have done our two here, but really, can we do any better? Interesting. So we cannot run four and five in parallel, right? Because instruction five depends on the results of instruction four. So even though I came, you know, I came to, to help out, we had more processing power. It didn't help at all in this program because there was not enough independent work to do. So I'm going to thank, uh, thank uh, Joshua and, and Mohammed and clear, clear all you out. Um, so really what's going on here is they analyzed the dependencies in the program and figured out what could be done independently and in parallel. So that gets us to the first idea of our talk. Before you saw multi-core CPUs, before you heard about modern GPUs, almost every you know, mainstream processor on the planet was performing this analysis for you. And this is the idea of superscalar execution. So a modern processor like an Intel chip is taking a look at the instructions in an instruction stream and automatically figuring out which ones are independent and can potentially be executed in parallel. And so without any work by you, without any work by a compiler, this chip is able to run the program a little bit faster. Now, in order to carry out these parallel operations, we had to change the processor. And notice, look what I did. I decided to add two fetch and decode units because now I need to run multiple uh, instructions at once, so I need to uh, determine what two instructions to run. And I had to double my number, my execution units, because we had to execute two, pro 
two uh, operations at once. And I added a little orange box at the top, which you can think of as you know, the sophisticated logic to basically be Joshua and Muhammad to figure out what could be done in parallel. Okay. And so this diagram I have is a little cartoony, but you know, it's not all that different. If we go look at the block diagram from an old Pentium 4, and you use my color coding scheme, hey, look at this. There's three instruction decode units. There's four ALUs that can do different things at once. And there's one execution context, which is the blue box. Now, as we saw in that demonstration, when I came to help out, did me helping out do any good at all? Were, the, were we able to complete the plot? It didn't, right? Like I came to help. And at the end of the day, we could not run any faster than three clocks, get the thing done at three clocks. And that's what a lot of researchers in computer architecture observed, that in the, in the 90s, when this was a big deal in architecture, the idea was as we had more and more transistors, let's turn it into some more and more sophisticated logic to find those parallel instructions for you. And it turns out that you know, the more units you add, the x-axis here is the, the number of volunteers on screen, the number of parallel units, the speed up, how much faster you are running, kind of tapped out at about four, which kind of makes sense, right? If I have a list of things to do, let's say I'm like making dinner, it's pretty hard to find enough parallels and to put a bunch of people making progress in the kitchen. Okay. So a lot of folks talk about the end of Moore's Law, but Moore's Law is largely about the number of transistors you can put on a chip. And while that might be slowing down and there's some real roadblocks in the future, if you look at graphs, even into close to modern times, we have been adding more and more transistors to chips. But turning that into superscalar execution or smarts to predict what could be done in parallel just wasn't yielding more performance. We were building these bigger and bigger chips that weren't running that much faster. Okay. So to talk about what people started doing differently, I need to introduce a little bit more complex example. Now, this is an example I like to use because it's pretty simple. It's also a program that I have my students write in the first assignment in class. So take a look at the C code and make sure you understand what it does. I'll summarize it, which is that it just takes an input array of uh, X and computes the sign of all the elements of X, like it just runs sign. Uh, or, and it, it does it with some code here that's a Taylor expansion, approximation of sign. That part's not important. But all you, know, uh, all you should care about is that for I equals 0 to N, we're going to do something on every element of the input array. We're going to kick the output into Y sub I. Okay. And it's a piece of C code. So the processor is going to run that for the first element, and then the second element, and so on, and so on. Okay. So is there any questions about this code? Again, the details of how it computes sign, not really important. I just want you to know it's a piece of code that runs the same basic C code for every single element in the input array. OK to keep going? Don't be shy if you have any questions. All right, thanks. OK, so just like before, we're going to compile this program. And the result of, the com of compilation is going to be we're going to have a sequence of instructions. So I'm showing you that sequence of instructions now. And just for simplicity, let's just think about the basic block of instructions that carries out the body of the loop. And so that's why up here at the top, I've decided to sort of show you like the input is one element of the array, and the output is another element of the array. So again, if I go back to my simple processor, as we talked about, every clock, we're going to run one instruction. Notice that there's only one orange box here, one yellow box. There is no superscalar execution capability. Now, if I went to a superscalar processor, OK, look, what I did is I have two units now that could run in parallel. This processor would have to go find parallel instructions in this basic block in order to leverage that capability. And if you look at the fake instructions that I've made up here, those are dependent instructions. So this fancier processor would do no good in speeding things up. OK. okay. So now we're about to get to idea number two in the talk, which was up until basically 15, 20 years ago, if you were a hardware architect, your job was to figure out how to do clever things, find parallel instructions, predict future memory operations, execute in, in different orders, build fancy caches to help this one instruction stream run a lot faster than before. 
but those were not giving good benefits. If something is inherently sequential, there's not much parallelism to find. So idea number two in the talk is rather than build this fancy processor core with all this smarts, let's rip a lot of those smarts out and build something much, much simpler. And since we build something much, much simpler, we have room on these increasingly big chips to just build multiple cores. So now I have a multi-core processor with two cores. Each one of those cores um, has one execution unit, can process one instruction stream, but can only do one thing at once, but I have two of them. But for any one instruction stream, it might be a little slower. It has no superscalar, it doesn't have a big fancy cache, doesn't have a lot of the smarts that we really were, were leveraging in the past. So if I only had one thing to do, like if all I had to do was process one element of the array, I might actually run slower on this new processor. You know, imagine if Intel came out with a processor that ran all previous code slower than before. People are gonna get fired. But I actually have a capability to run two things at once, each one a little bit slower. So if I had a program that gave me two things to do, two instructions to run, two elements to process in parallel, there would be a speed up here. I would be running one point times, five times faster. Now going back to our C program, if I compile this program with something like Clang or GCC, I'm gonna get a single instruction stream. I have not defined any parallelism at all. So this is an example of a program that's now gonna run 25% slower. You know, I'm gonna get fired. The chip manufacturer is gonna get fired. Everybody's gonna get fired. Now, if you wanted to take advantage of this processor, and let's say you are a little bit familiar with uh, uh, C programming, or pick your favorite language, and I'm starting to see some discussion on the, in the chat about threads, how would you change this program to get that 1.5x speed up? I wanna see some answers in the chat. You could create two, two processes. You could use a language that explicitly uh, denotes parallelism. You could write some th you could write some threads, right? You could parallelize the outer for loop. And so that's actually what I did here, and I did it in kind of the nastiest way possible. I spawned two thread. I spawned a thread. So if you look carefully at this code, and you're a little bit familiar with C, and I want you to like, what does this code do? This code spawns one thread. The main thread calls the sign function that we already had, and the spawn thread also calls the sign function. So I have two threads of control now, each one doing what? I split the work in half. You got to really look at the how I move, you know, how I set up the arguments here. Does the main thread do the first half of the array or the second half of the array? This will check your understanding. What do you think? The main thread, which is the call to sign x, is actually working on the second half of the array. Look, exactly, Radoslav got it. So the first thread actually does the first n over two elements, the second thread does the rest. So this is a program that I wrote that via calls to a p thread, to, to a threading API, created two threads of control. The operating system says, look, we have two instruction streams. And those instruction streams get uh, run on both of the cores. Now, most of us these days aren't going to you know, write threaded code to get that type of parallelism. Some folks in the chat box mentioned, hey, you, know, you just want to parallelize the outer for loop using whatever framework you might be familiar with. OpenMP is an example, thread building blocks. Uh, and there are many, many parallel programming libraries. I made up some syntax on this slide where I changed that for loop to just be a for all loop. And I want you to just interpret for all loop, which says, hey, I as the programmer am telling the machine, the compiler, that you can generate parallel code here by parallelizing the iterations of the loop however you want. So this code right here might get compiled, given a library, to the threaded code that I had on the previous slide. 
Okay, so I'm starting to see some uh, uh, a little bit of like some some confused faces. So go ahead and hit me up with a question. See if I how can I clarify? The important thing on this slide is that I've written a program that says every iteration of the loop can be executed independently and in parallel. And I'm imagining that someone might take that information, a compiler, a runtime, and say, oh, OK, well, I'm going to do the first half of the array on one thread and a second half of the array on the other thread. I'll create the threads for the programmer so the programmer doesn't have to write this sort of crappy, ugly code on the previous slide. This is what li many libraries that are out there today do for you. Any questions? Did that help? Any thoughts? I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and really quickly just take uh, uh, Hul's question uh, about uh, ILP. Uh, there was a question about how many cycles does it take to figure out what instructions can be run in parallel? And uh, you know, this is stuff that there's hardware in the chip to do that. So this is constantly running every cycle. And it's just part of the, the pipeline. Right? The challenge is that if you have to look over huge numbers of instructions to figure out what can be done in parallel, then that becomes, becomes a very expensive in the design of hardware operation. Whereas in this program that I just wrote, as a programmer, I can say, hey, hardware, you don't need to like work really hard to figure out what's parallel. I'm just going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you. Right? And I see another question here about why doesn't the code specify which core I want to run the instructions on directly. Um, you can control those things, but typically in most systems, the assignment of threads of control to processor cores is a function of the operating system. So usually the operating system is making that decision for you. OK, so let's keep going. If I make these simple cores and I keep getting more and more transistors, shoot, I can start adding a lot of cores to a chip. Here's a four core processor. Here's a 16 core processor. And now, my new fictitious processor is processing 16 instruction streams in parallel. Each core is running one of those instruction streams, one of those threads. And each core is running one instruction from that thread per clock. So this processor can do 16 uh, things in parallel if I created enough of those threads as the application developer. And again, this is my little cartoon, but if we look at diagrams of real chips, here's an example of a recent Intel chip where there's your 10 cores in a modern core uh, i, I9. Uh, the right side is, uh, is uh, I think, graphics. That's why uh, there's some space on the right side of the chip. Here's a modern NVIDIA GPU. And if you take a look at what they call their streaming multiprocessors, or this SMs, you can just stamp out 84 of those on a modern GPU. You know, a few years ago, Intel put out a 72-core processor. Any mobile chip you have these days is also multi-core. You know, in fact, Apple, like an A13, has completely different types of cores. Some cores actually have a lot more of that fancy stuff in them to run instruction streams, a single instruction stream quickly. Other cores are actually a lot lighter weight. So there's not necessarily, uh, there's no homogeneity in some of these designs. <laughs> okay. So let's keep going. I'm going to delay this question about what are threads until later. Or another way to think about it is a thread is just a, a, a sequence of instructions and the environment that they run in. Because remember, when we're running a sequence of instructions, we have to change, we have to update state. So a thread really is just a definition of that state. Now, one thing I like about my data parallel higher level version of the program is that if I tell the system that all this work is independent, then the system can make a decision for me. A smart compiler can say, you know what? Like, I'm going to figure out how to parallelize it for you. And in this case, this particular program, the parallelism comes from this for all loop. So we know that you know, every single iteration is doing the exact same thing. It's running the exact same code. And that gets me to idea number three in this talk, which is if all of this, of everything I'm trying to do in parallel requires the same instructions, there's an opportunity to be more efficient. And that opportunity is, you know what? We're just going to decode one instruction 
And we're going to run that instruction on eight different ALUs in this case. So I took my one ALU and I splatted it out into eight, but they all have to do the same thing. They share the control logic. They share the instruction stream processing. So this is often called SIMD processing. This is single instruction, multiple data. And the idea is for a lot of applications, machine learning, computer graphics, and so on and so on. Most of the time, a lot of the things that we're doing are all the same. So there's an opportunity to be had. So if we go back to our original program, which remember was compiled to scalar operations on scalar uh, uh, registers and processed one element of the array at a time, took xi to yi, this program isn't going to take advantage of these fancy new instructions that can do eight things at once. Now, just like I did last time where I showed you kind of a, a low-level representation, one thing I could do if I wanted to be a little, you know, I wanted to be elite, is I could write, rewrite my C code into something that looks like this using special intrinsic functions that describe operations on eight wide vector registers. And if you haven't done anything in, in, like this in your life, I recommend that you, you do. Um, it's good for you. But this is terrible code to look at. Right. But what this code is doing is I replaced all the normal math operations with the equivalence of operations on eight wide vectors. And if you look closely, my loop is actually going not from one to n by single steps, but actually one to n by eight. And so these instructions tell a compiler, or these operations tell a compiler like GCC or Clang to actually change the output binary to emit different instructions that describe the behavior of these vector operations on eight wide operate on on eight wide vectors in this case because I'm in this example I'm using Intel's uh, AVX intrinsics. So now my compiled program that single instruction stream is actually processing eight elements of data at once, which you can kind of see in my little diagram up here and down here. Okay, so now I've changed my processor. I still have sixteen cores. I can still run 16 instruction streams at once, one on each of the cores. Every core can still only do one instruction at a time. But now those instructions are being run on eight pieces of data at once. So I actually have 128 execution units. And my speed up could be as much as 128 from my original simple uh, uh, core. Now, I need 128 things to do in parallel to get this. OK. Now, one of the nice things about this high-level data parallel way of thinking is that all I did was I told the compiler things were independent. So the compiler can now decide what types of parallelism it wants to use to get the job done. It may generate these AVX instructions for me, these SIMD instructions for me. It may decide to create threads for me to run on the different cores. I don't have to think about that as a programmer. I rely on a good compiler or runtime system to make those decisions. I am just responsible for telling the system, look, don't worry about figuring out what's independent. I will just tell you. Okay. So there's a question here from Kurt, which is, what's the difference between the vector hardware versus typical hardware? I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question, but the big difference here is typically, like, you know, if we think about scalar operations, uh, an add or a multiply is going to take a 32-bit or a 64-bit value, a single number, perform an operation, and produce a single number's output. These SIMD operations are taking a vector of some fixed length, like four or eight elements, and doing an element-wise vector operation, like element-wise vector multiply, and producing four or eight outputs at a time. So it's largely what we've, we've replaced or augmented single um, scalar instructions with an additional set of functionality that's vector. And that additional functionality is fairly cheap to put in a processor because we did not add any additional instruction stream processing or control. We just added math units. And math units are pretty cheap these days. OK. But there's a bit of a catch. So if all of the, if the processor has to do the same thing for, in this case, all eight, for eight pieces of data, um, what happens? when different iterations of the loop 
need different instructions. Like for example, put some code in here that has an if statement. And if you look at the code on the right, which is a new example, but I simplified it to make it a little bit readable, it's for every input value x sub i, if the value is greater than zero, we do mole mole add. If the value is less than zero, we do something completely different. So what's gonna happen here? How can I run this code where different elements might need different instructions on a processor that can only run one instruction at a time but can do eight things? So imagine a case where well, we're running along and what I'm visualizing here is time in clocks is going down the page. And horizontally across the page, you can think about the eight elements, the eight iterations of the, uh, the loop that I'm trying to do in parallel with these SIMD instructions. And let's just assume that for some of these iterations, that if statement evaluates to true and for others it evaluates to false. How can we make this program work on this processor with this constraining set of rules? So I hear some folks yelling out masks, but that's a, that's a little bit of jargon. I like, like can we, what's a higher level, uh, let's just describe it in simpler terms. What is this process, how, how do we solve this? Like if I have like, I've got to do eight things at once, but not everybody needs that thing. So we're gonna have to find some way to like do instructions for the if branch and then do instructions for the else branch or maybe I do instructions for both the if branch and the else branch and then don't update the, 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 the registers for some of them. So that's like what Rodrigo and uh, Dan said here with like do the instructions and drop the result. Exactly. So you have all come up with various implementation strategies. And I'm going to you know, show you one of them. So in this case, what I decided to do is the processor is running this instruction stream and it realizes, shoot, some of the iterations need to go down the true branch and others need to go down the false branch. So it first is gonna run the true. It's gonna run those three instructions for the true and write those registers. But the lanes in the vector that correspond to false iterations, we're just gonna turn off. We're gonna mask them out, prevent uh, the update of registers. Think about it however you wish, but we're just not gonna do that work. And then I noticed somebody in the chat says, well, why don't we just skip the wasted stuff? Well, we did just skip the wasted stuff, but we do have to actually run the else branch for the first the iterations that need it. So then we go back and run, take two instructions to run the else branch. So in this code, since some of the loop iterations went true and other went false, even though any one iteration needed at most three instructions, it takes me eight, or sorry, five cycles to get this done. And in the worst case, in the worst case, I might be doing one eighth of the peak performance of the SIMD processor. Of course, after the, uh, the, the if branch uh, uh, is done, then uh, you know, we can resume at full rate. So this is the basics of how we might handle conditional control flow on a, a parallel SIMD processor like this. And as you're pointing out, oh, one eighth, why one eighth peak performance? And why is the worst case factor of eight? That's a great question. And let's think about that a little bit more. So what is the worst case here? Well, let's think about first of all, the best case is that every execution unit is always doing useful work right? That would mean our utilization is 100, 100%. And if our utilization of our math units is 100%, we can't do any faster. What's the worst case that this processor can be put in? Yeah, the worst case is that every execution unit is useless, I guess. But, but really, like, like we're not going to run, we're not going to run instructions that nobody needs. We're going to have, but we do have to run an instruction if at least one iteration needs it. So imagine a situation where out of this group of eight, only one of uh, the eight threads actually needed uh, to run the branch. And during that time, the processor would be running at one eighth peak performance. 
Okay, so I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad that question was asked because I'd like everybody to puzzle over this a little bit. So I'm going to send everybody back to those same breakout rooms where, you, where you've already been. And I want you to talk about, can you think of a piece of C code, an if else statement, that gives me worst case performance on average throughout the entire block? And I, a hint is you can do it with a single if statement. And I want, a, I want a piece of code, if this, else that, that puts this processor overall at one eighth performance. So I'm going to shove everybody out to these breakouts. You're gonna, if I did things correctly, you're going to be with the same group of people, so you don't have to introduce yourself. And uh, I'll pull everybody back in about four minutes, let's say. Just give it, give it some talk. All right, let's see how this goes. OK. So everybody should be should be back. Um, uh, someone said in the chat that you were in completely new groups. Was this true? Ah, no. Okay, good. I think the people that were in new groups were probably people that came in after after uh, after the first breakout. So I think at least seems like most of my code worked. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So people may have may have left. I can't I can't stop that. That's a that's a, a problem with the, uh, with the lecture. OK, so anyway, hopefully you were able to talk about it a little bit. And so what's, what's, the, what's the answer you came up with here? Philip. Well, um, I came to the idea that basically we could do completely different types of instructions. So basically, in the if statement, an assignment, and in the else statement, a pointer dereference, for example. OK, but I want 1 eighth performance. So, so that will create the sort of inefficiency that we discussed before. But yeah. I want a situation where the processor for a really long period of time is just running with only one of the eight vector units doing anything. So you created a situation where different instructions were needed. Maybe even one of them took a, a memory stall or something like that. But it's not 100% guaranteed that that this worst case scenario has been created. Now I'm seeing something in the chat where uh, Octave, if I'm sorry if I mispronounce you, is suggesting that we need to create a situation where exactly one of the loop iterations is different than the rest. And so I, I believe this proposal is if the loop index mod eight is zero, or uh, then this one iteration for every group of eight is gonna be different than every other one. <clears throat> so we're almost done. We're almost done. Thank you for that. But imagine how we said, if one element in the array did this, then run this one instruction. Else, 7 eighths of the array are going to go the other way. What would be my overall performance if I just did that? It would actually be on average be about fifty percent. I'm not. It's not bad. Half the time I was really inefficient. The other half the time I was very efficient. But I see something that Joshua has put here, which he said, "Oh, when I'm running the if block with one of the iterations, we need to be doing a lot of work, and then the else block should do nothing." So it's really, if this is true for one of the threads then uh, uh, do a long set of work that only one way needs to do. Else, 7 eighths of the, the work all works together, but you know, it's, it's only just a little bit of work. So on average, uh, you're, you're, doing pretty, you're doing really poorly. So I'm trying to look at this question about uh, uh, would it depend on the data. Well, the proposal that I saw in the chat was actually one that conditioned on the loop index. But you can imagine an array with data items where one out of every eight consecutive elements was positive and the other was negative. That would create the same situation given the code that I had on the board before. OK. Um, I see somebody saying that they, they can't hear me anymore. Um, how's my, my, my audio? If for whatever reason I cut out a nice simple fix is just refresh the page, and that will re, re, uh, relatch on everything. OK, so let's keep moving. We have some terminology. And as, as you might hear, especially if you're a, a GPU programmer, uh, you might hear about this term called coherent threads or coherent execution. And coherent execution just means 
that the various lanes of the vector all need to do the same thing. So it's a situation where you'll use a SIMD processor very efficiently. Divergent execution, it, uh, you know, loop iteration divergence, thread divergence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera is just the lack of, co of, of coherence. So in that breakout, I just asked you to create a situation of maximal divergence. And some examples of this in modern uh, processors is some people have been shouting out about a AVX2 in the chat. We have uh, you know, AVX2 or eight wide vector instructions. AVX512 is uh, you know, 16 wide. Arm Neon is similar. Many of the CPU platforms build things very much like what I've just talked about here. The compiler generates these vector instructions. The ideas on the, the uh, on, the, on a GPU are very, very similar. Very much the same idea of SIMD processing, but they do it a little bit differently. Instead of relying on the compiler to generate SIMD instructions, they actually are just running a bunch of iterations at the same time, and the hardware determines when the iterations are running the same instruction, and then automatically lines them up and runs them SIMD. So it's the exact same concept at a high level, the different implementation. That's why you'll hear NVIDIA say things like our architecture is SIMT, not SIMD. They have a, a different name for it. And it really is a different concept you know, in terms of the implementation. So I put an extra video online off the main page for you to learn more about that. Okay. Um, so an NVIDIA architect is very correct when they say we are not SIMD. But if you kind of step, take a step up, the processor to software behaves very similarly in most situations. If you don't have instruction stream uh, uh, coherence, you will not run very efficiently. Okay, so there we go. That's uh, the first, you know, in this first hour of this hour and a half, we've kind of gotten through several forms of parallel execution. We talked about superscalar execution, which is the processor looking inside one instruction stream to figure out what can automatically be paralyzed. We've looked at SIMD instructions, which says, look, we're going to run the same operation on a boatload of ALUs. And we've talked about multi-core, which is just taking what we have and replicating it over and over and over again. And I can create many different examples with my cartoon diagrams of different combinations of these. Like this uh, example here in the, the top left is a single core processor that's super scalar, runs one instruction stream, but finds two instructions. Here was our dual core processor, a very simple processor that does Every instruction stream, one's run instruction at a time, but can run two different instruction streams. And then here is a quad core processor, four cores, where each of those cores can run SIMD instructions inside of them. Okay. And if we look at real modern processors, they're just different combinations. So in the lab at Stanford, we have some of these Cavi Lakes. And the lab that we run on for our student assignments is four cores. These cores actually can do three vector instructions at once. And if you multiply four cores times three vector instructions times eight wide SIMD at 4.2 gigahertz, we're sitting around at about 400 gigaflops. You can just multiply all these things, count the ALUs, and figure out the peak performance of the processor. Those of you that really know Intel microarchitectures, I'm not showing instruction fetch and decode and, and units for scalar or load and stores here. And the big thing I want you to keep in mind is that GPUs are the exact same concepts, just pushed to some extreme scale. For example, you take a V100, which you can go rent on Amazon right now, you're going to see about 80 of these SMs, and each of those SMs has 128 SIMD ALUs divided into 32 wide SIMD banks. So this would be a good time for me to stop and, uh, and see if anybody has any, any questions or anything we should discuss before we, we do a little bit more on something that's perhaps even more important, accessing memory. So how's everything going? Cool. All right. So just to set the playing field, in the last we got about 15 more minutes that I'd like to get uh, that I'm going to try and do is what is memory? <laughs> what the heck is memory? If a program was just a list of instructions, a processor is, runs the instructions, and running an uh, instruction just modifies program state. We've kind of focused on one type of program state right now, which is the state of the registers. Memory is another 
part of that program state. And I see some things in the chat box as a pool of bits, it's storage of data. Logically, abstractly, memory is just a table of values, just an array of values, where every value has an address. Here I gave you a table of values. I'm writing the addresses in hex, just because uh, it's a lot easier to read addresses in, in this form. And if you give me an address, I'll tell you the value that is stored at that address in this big table of memory. Okay, so in the illustration on the right, the program's memory address space is 32 bytes in size. I have 32 rows in the table. Valid addresses range from 0 to 31. And these are the values. You know, at, at address uh, hex 8, the value is 32. At address uh, 16, the value is 128. And so certain instructions, like math operations in a program, manipulate the state of registers. Loads and stores in a program can manipulate or read the state of memory. So here's a load instruction that takes, um, oops, excuse me, a load instruction that takes the value in register two, which is a memory address, and says, go put in register zero, the value in memory, 42, as determined by the address held in R2, okay? So memory is just another form of state, but it's farther away from the processor than those registers. It takes a while to access that data. And the latency of accessing memory, the latency of an operation is the amount of time it takes that operation to complete. So for example, the latency of accessing memory might be 100 clock cycles, which means when the processor says, I need this value in memory, it sits there and waits for 100 clock cycles, or in this example, maybe two seconds in my PowerPoint slide memory bus for that data to get there. So we just made a big deal about running at one eighth efficiency. We just made a big deal about, gosh, we could be running at one eighth on a SIMD, you know, on a SIMD part. But what if we're sitting around waiting for a hundred clock cycles? That could make us run at a hundred, one hundredth of the total efficiency of the processor. If it reads a, a value, waits for a hundred cycles, then does a math op and so on and so on. So we have this major problem. We just built all of these arithmetic units, do all this processing. And if it takes a long time for the data to get to them, those processing units may be idle for a very long time. Most of the time, they're not doing anything. They're just waiting. So if you're a CPU architect, or really if you're any processor architect, but in particular, if you're a CPU architect, how do you combat the problem of waiting on memory? Or in other words, why do CPUs have big caches? and an incredibly complex cache hierarchy. They have like little caches, little on-chip storage right by the processor, bigger cache storage farther from the processor, even bigger on-chip storage a little bit farther from everything. By co-locating data near the processing elements, they are able to reduce the length of time it takes to address memory. So these caches are storing copies of data now, copies of values in memory, they're starting to copy right here in data storage right next to the processor. So like anything you know, in life, if it's small, you can keep it local. If it's big, you're going to have to put it in storage somewhat farther away. Okay. So caches reduce memory access latencies. And to get kind of visceral about how much you have to wait around if data is not in a cache, here's an example of the various latencies in a modern Intel CPU. L, you know, L1 latency, four cycles. So if we had to like, uh, if we had to visualize it, this is the amount of time it takes data if it's in the L1. You see that? That's the latency of an L1 axis. L2 axis, L1, L2, 12 cycles. L3, about 40 cycles. And if you miss the cache, if you have to go out to memory, you're gonna be waiting like this we're still waiting on that data to go back. So in any modern processor, if you miss a cache, you, are, are, you can be dead. You can really be dead in terms of your performance. Okay. So this is not good, but we can employ you know, some basic common sense that we all do all the time. Like for example, you know, we, we told each other what our favorite foods are. Imagine in that meal, like let's say I, I'm cooking tonight. If I start boiling water, 
am I going to sit there and watch the water boil until it's ready? Am I going to sit there and wait for the oven to heat up? Or what am I going to do instead? Or for those of you that are current students, how many of you put your laundry in the washer and then just stare at the washer for the hour it takes for it to get done? So what do you do in these situations in life when you know something's going to take a while? Prefetch. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Now, I'm not, okay, yeah, we can prefetch. We could do something else. Ah, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty simple common sense stuff. Like if you know something's going to take a long time, you need to start it in advance. Or if something starts taking a long time, go do something else. And that's all it is. That's idea four in the talk is we are going to, when, when a processor cannot make progress because it's waiting on memory, it's going to go work on something else. So here's that illustrated in, you know, back in our cartoon diagram. So I asked somebody, someone was uh, uh, asking about the, the icons again. So just a reminder, here's a single core processor. It has one execution context. So it's running one instruction stream. This happens to be eight wide vector, it has one instruction per clock and can run the eight wide vector instructions. And so in this diagram, I'm, gonna, I'm illustrating what the processor is running at every moment in time. So time is vertical in this case. And so what I'm showing you right here is like right now I'm running a thread that is executing these vector instructions. Now at some point, that vector, those vector instructions, there, there's a load. And because the program needs data from memory, it is not runnable for some period of time. So at this point, the processor is like, I need data for the next instruction. And, uh, and this thread, it can't make progress. I cannot run the in next instruction stream until right here. So we're going to take this idea of if we can't make progress, shit, we're going to do something else. And I change the processor now. So for the first time, you see multiple blue boxes. There are now multiple execution contexts stored on the processor. So in other words, I replicated the register state of the processor four times. And now this processor can hold the environment, can hold state for four different instruction streams, even though it can only execute an instruction from one of the instruction streams at one time. So look at this. So one instruction per clock, one orange box, eight little uh, you know, yellowish boxes. That means that one instruction can be vector. But now we have four different sets of registers that can hold the state of four different instruction streams or four different threads. So the hardware architects often refer to execution context as threads, just because an execution context is the hardware component that holds the environment needed to run a thread. So now when, the, when thread one stalls, this processor just switches immediately over and says, I already have the register state for another thread available. Let me just run the next instruction that it needs. So it switches over immediately and starts making progress. Oops, sorry, I did too much. It, uh, so switch on stall, switch on stall. And so it starts just running whatever it can. And now it has four threads that it can choose from. And if you look at any one horizontal line in my diagram, you'll notice that the processor at any time is running an instruction from one of its four threads. So what is the utilization of the processor in this example? Full. Exactly, it's 100%. Even though at any one time, none of those, no thread is actually running at the time. So we are interleaving execution of all these threads in order to get 100% utilization. Now notice that any one thread now is actually going to complete slower with higher latency than it would have been if we were only running one thread. Like in this case, this thread became runnable here, so we could have finished it up starting right here. Instead, we didn't do anything on this thread until later, and then we finished it. So this idea of, of throughput-oriented, multi-threaded computing is kind of saying, look, I don't care so much about how fast each one thread completes. 
my goal is to maintain as high utilization as possible so that I get all the threads done in the, the lowest amount of time. And this is what I care about if I'm working on a million pixels in graphics or huge numbers of activations in machine learning or some kind of uh, scientific computation. So I have all of this parallelism. Now, in this case, I'm not, I, I need more than just eight parallel things. In this case, I actually needed other things to do. So I needed 32 elements in this case to have available to me to get this latency hiding benefit. And some people think about context switching and they go, oh, like the operating system context switching is slow. Keep in mind that this is all being done inside the hardware itself. So every clock cycle, this thread, uh, this core is switching to a runnable thread. Think about this core is now a scheduler. Now there is no free lunch. We have to hold these execution, you know, these registers on chip and now we need a lot more registers. So if we only have one thread per core, you know, that thread might be able to use a large number of registers. If we want to put many threads on the core and get a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, latency hiding, well, each one of those threads can probably only use a few registers per thread because like the, the storage is, is, is finite. Right? So here's an example of 16 in threads. If one thread stalls, I have 15 other things to choose from, but every thread only has a few registers it might have at its disposal. Conversely, here's an example where I only have four threads. There's only three other threads to choose from, but those threads can have a much larger working set. Okay? And keep in mind that nothing we're doing in this part of the lecture adds compute capability to the processor. This core that I'm showing you still can run one instruction per clock, and that instruction is an eight-wide SIMD instruction. Now the thread can just choose which, sorry, the core can choose which of the four threads it wants to draw that instruction from. So here's the last thing we're going to do together today. What I'm describing here, OK, so, so imagine you have a processor that can run one instruction per clock. That's all it can do. But it has two threads of control. So I notice I have two execution contexts. And I want you to think about the, the utilization of this processor. So for example, now I, I kind of switch things up on you. Time is now going to the right. And imagine I had a piece of code that did three operations. So notice that this blue bar spans three clock cycles. And then it does a memory operation and has to wait for 12 clock cycles. So you can imagine like it's a for loop, like load data, do some compute, load data, do some compute. And this, 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 my program just does this in a loop. So if this was a single threaded core, my program would do three, mat, three ops, the blue stuff, followed by wait for 12, three ops, wait for 12. What is the utilization? It's quite low, right? Because most of the time is red and not blue. In fact, if you kind of do the math visually, three out of every set of 15 cycles are blue. So we're only doing useful work one fifth of the time. What happens if I add a second thread? Now all of a sudden when I stall, the core moves immediately over to running the second thread. And it can do a little bit more work, but then it stalls, and so on and so on. Now the utilization is a little bit higher, because out of every block of 15 cycles, I get six cycles of useful work, one cycle or three cycles for each of my threads. So how many threads do I need to get peak utilization? I need five, right? Because I have 12 cycles to, to fill. I get three, uh, I get an overlap factor of three from each of my threads. So I need four other threads, oops, sorry, to get 100% utilization. Notice now in this diagram, vertically, at any point in time, some thread is running. But I can only do one operation at a time. Okay. What happens if I just keep going and I add eight threads? Because if five threads is better than two threads, shouldn't more threads be better again? What would be my utilization if I was using eight threads? Thread zero would have to wait again, correct. But I asked about utilization. What is the utilization with eight threads? It still stays 100. 
Exactly. But as was pointed out by Radoslav in the chat, notice that any one thread makes progress slower. So the latency of completing the operations for one piece of data might slow down. And so in this case, actually, five threads would be a better system because I still got 100% utilization, and I had lower latency on any of my operations. So this is the idea of hardware multi-threading. The core manages execution context for multiple threads so that it can automatically, on the fly, uh, at a single clock cycle's notice, switch to a new thread whenever it can't make progress on what it's doing now. Okay. And this idea of having multiple threads uh, uh, is you might hear about it in Intel hyper-threading. You really hear about it on GPUs, and I really recommend this going farther video that I have on the website that really explains both multi-threading on GPUs and in modern CPUs as an example. But here we go. So we're getting to the end of the lecture. This is the chip that I've built up in front of you for the whole lecture. I have 16 cores, one instruction per clock per core, one orange box, eight wide SIMD instructions, eight operations per instruction, four threads per core to kind of hide a, um, memory latency. So this means I can do 16 instructions at the same time, but I'm actually interleaving four times 16, 64 total instruction streams at once. And remember, every one of those 64 instruction streams is running eight wide vector operations. So 64 times eight is to keep this chip busy. I need 512 independent pieces of work. That's how much parallelism I need to run this chip at full utilization with maximum latency hiding ability. So everything that you've learned here, this applies to Intel CPUs. There's two threads per core with hyper-threading. And it applies to an extreme degree to modern GPUs. So here's an example of actually this. Everything on this slide is one NVIDIA SM for the, uh, the V100. And it looks really complex, but it's actually quite simple in terms of what we talked about today. This core has the ability to run four instructions per clock. In some sense, this is a form of, uh, and it has what amounts to 64 execution contexts that it can choose from every clock. So every clock, it takes a look at 64 what NVIDIA calls warps, or you can kind of think of as SIMD threads to choose from, and chooses four of those to make progress on. So my example before, I only ran one thread at a time and chose amongst four. This one runs four threads at a time on the same core and chooses amongst 64. Now these threads themselves are running up to 32 wide vector instructions. So this single core on the GPU has 64 execution contexts or 70 execution contexts that are 32 wide. So that's 2,000 pieces of data you need to run this core at peak throughput and peak um, latency hiding. And keep in mind, there's 84 of these on the chip. So if you're not sitting around with 163,000 pieces of data at once, you are not using this with maximal lat latency hiding capability. This is a single chip that can that could operationalize up to 163,000 parallel things at once. Now, in practice, as we saw, you don't necessarily always need all of those threads in order to hide the latency. So you usually don't need 163,000, but you definitely need to be in the regime of tens of thousands of pieces of independent work if you want a chance of utilizing a GPU well. OK. So the story so far. If you want to use these CPUs and GPUs effectively, you need to have sufficient parallel work to use all of these execution units. Groups of that work better have the same instructions, or you're going to lose large constant factors due to SIMD divergence. And you actually need more parallel work than ALUs, so you can allow these chips to do a little bit of multi-threading in order to help you hide your latency. And if folks want to stick around for one more, for like three or four more seconds, I'd like to talk about one more thing. Let's go back to this NVIDIA GPU. I've told you about how many ALUs in there, basically 60 kind of cores, 60 SMs, 128 ALUs per SM. That's 5,000 ALUs. 
So think a little bit about supplying all those ALUs with data from memory each clock. We're not talking about latency anymore because we can hide latency with all those threads. So we know how to keep them at full rate if we can just get data into them fast enough. Now we're talking about memory bandwidth. Memory bandwidth is the rate at which data items can get to the processor from memory, 20 gigabytes per second. Or in the example I just showed you, you know, about four gray boxes per second. That's my bandwidth. Notice that the latency was about two seconds for any one gray box to get from one side of the screen to the other. Now, if I want to increase my bandwidth, I can just start sending more data in parallel. Like, for example, now I have eight gray boxes per second with the same latency as before. So GPUs, because they have so many ALUs on them, need huge amounts of memory bandwidth. And that's why you see these modern server class GPUs as the, they have, they're attached to these high bandwidth memories that are getting close to supplying. Well, actually, they've surpassed it now. You know, we're talking about terabytes per second of bandwidth using uh, HBM chips that are right next to these processors. So here's a thought experiment I want to leave you with at the end of the lecture. Because it's almost like everything I've said in this lecture doesn't matter unless you take care of the problem that's on this slide. Imagine that you're doing the simplest parallel computation you can think of. Let's add two vectors, like you know, your, your standard uh, PyTorch code or uh, NumPy code or whatnot. I just want to take 10 million element vector A, element-wise multiply it, actually, not add, times B to get the result C. Is this a good operation to accelerate on something like that V100 GPU? What do y'all think? How many people think it's a good operation? Give me a thumbs up. How many people think it's a bad operation? Give me a thumbs down. There's a lot of thumbs downs. Why is that? This, this seems perfect. It met all of the requirements that I had back uh, uh, here. I had huge amounts of parallel work. It all was doing the same thing. I have more parallel work than NVIDIA could ever put ALUs on the chip. I have millions of elements. Is this a good operation? Why am I getting all these thumbs down? Because you're exactly right. How many bytes of memory are needed to pull off A times B equals C. So for every element in these arrays, I need to load, let's say they're FP32s. I have two numbers I read and one I write. That's 12 bytes of operation. If you multiply 12 bytes per operation times 5,000 operations per clock times we're doing 1.6 billion clocks per second, you just you multiply those together, you say, well, if I'm going to keep these operations doing a math op, all these, op, all these execution units doing a math op per clock, I need 98 terabytes per second of bandwidth to keep these things busy. The data pipe needs to be 100 terabytes per second to keep this chip busy. What data pipe do we have? We have got an amazing one, but it's only one, to giga, one terabyte per second. So this operation which seems the most parallel friendly thing in the universe, is going to run on this GPU at less than 1% efficiency. Now, it still may be fast because you have so much bandwidth. You read the data faster than you would on a CPU. You might run 10 to 12 times faster than a good CPU. But gosh, you're using that GPU inefficiently. So this is an example of computations being bandwidth limited. So once you start using all the ideas from this lecture and you pack a chip full of all these execution units, the name of the game becomes writing your programs so that they can get the, you can get data to all of these processing elements. And almost all of my parallel computing class at Stanford is not about parallelism. It's actually about structuring applications so that you can get data to these modern processors. And I think about any computer architect, all they think about is getting data to their processing elements. So in some sense, this parallel processing course is two or three lectures on how to make find your parallel work. And every assignment is largely about how to get data to all of those parallel units. OK, so what we learned today. We learned about how to pack these chips full of ALUs. 
we learn that GPUs and CPUs are shockingly similar at a conceptual level. GPUs are just pushing these concepts to extreme scales. And last, we learn that because there is so much capability on these chips, we saw a little bit of a taste of everything that we do in modern computing is largely about moving data around efficiently instead of computing efficiently. So thank you all very much for, uh, for coming. And I'll hang out a little bit. I imagine most people want to get out of here. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, feel free to click to step to the mic. We can, uh, let me change the layout here to something like this. And, uh, oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, there's this, uh, if you, if you want to give me feedback, like this worked, this didn't work, like I think a lot of the bugs we know about. But uh, if you want to give me feedback, there's a, a Google form here that you can just click that link and give me feedback in terms of what worked well, what didn't work. Cool. All right, thank you again. It was nice to meet everybody from around the world. And I'm going to hang out. We can answer some technical questions. Uh, a number of you were coming just to kind of see the classroom in action, and I'm happy to hang out and talk about that as well. So I'll kind of go through some of the questions that we have is, uh, let's see. Um, so we got the 1.8 peak. We weren't clear in the chat. Uh, or the, what is the difference between CPU cores and GPU cores? I mean, I, I think we started to get to that towards the end here is that they really do employ a lot of the same fundamental ideas. They just employ them at very different ratios and scales. So a CPU is making the decision to, well, a GPU is making the decision to maximize throughput at all costs because machine learning and computer graphics and image processing have huge amounts of parallel work and we largely care about parallel throughput. CPUs still have to run more conventional applications where latency and response time matters a lot. So that's why they've chosen different ratios of how parallel things should be versus how much we should prioritize minimizing latency and things like that. Yep. So it's not like one is better than the other. You have to like have this discussion in the context of the applications that you're trying to run. Hey, Apollo, how's it going? Hi, Kevin. Uh, so, so what bothers me is when you have enough, when you, when you finally do have enough, if ever, uh, bandwidth, what do you do with the with the with the data that's being held for threads which were stalled and haven't come back to yeah. run yet. That's a lot of data too. So there, there's no free launch. And and folks that want to take a more advanced architecture class, you know, well beyond even my own knowledge, is there's this huge question of how many threads do you want or need? So you want more threads to hide latency. That's great. You're going to reduce stalls by hiding latency. But there's a cost for adding more threads, right? Like you have to maintain more data on chip. Or if you're constrained by some fixed amount of data on chip, every thread can access less data. So the problem you get into is if I have all these you know, tiny threads with a very small amount of working set, well, then they're going to have to ask, access memory more often. So since they're accessing memory more often, you need more latency hiding ability. So as you add threads, if you shrink your threads in size, you actually generate need for more threads. And now most of your on-chip memory is now being used to hold these execution contexts that are sitting around not doing anything because they're stalled, as you mentioned, Apollo. So that's why there's always this tension. Like, should I give any uh, a thread a large working set? Because then hopefully, like, most of my memory accesses can be serviced by local data. And then I don't need latency hiding at all. So you know, it's it's there's this is a, a challenge that computer architects, whether they be CPU architects, GPU architects, accelerator architects, are always worried about, which is how do I know how how I balance throughput principles against more latency oriented principles. Hopefully that that helped Paul. All right, what else do we have? Um, What's the difference between cores and threads? Any any question? Anybody that's still here want to upvote some of those questions? So maybe I can prioritize. <laughs> when will the video? 
All right, when will the video be online? It'll be online sometime. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so, okay, so let me, let me ask a few of these here at the top. What is the difference between cores and threads? Um, so we talk about multi-threaded cores. So let me, let me actually pop back to some diagram here. Uh, let me uh, just do it. In fact, if we want to go through a sequence, this could be helpful. So let's let's do this as a quick review, and then maybe uh, this might answer a bunch of questions at once. Okay, so here was the example we had from class, right? Like we had the C program, and we compiled it to a single instruction stream. Now I started with the simplest possible processor. My processor had one fetch and decode unit, one hardware thread, and one ALU. This processor can only do one instruction per clock. So every clock, it's going to just run one instruction at a time. Okay, so I have a core. That core can run one thread. A thread you can think of as a logical sequence of instructions, so, you know, doing something. Pro you wanna, if you want to think about it as a process, go for it. I could add superscalar capability which means I still am only running instructions from one thread. There's one blue box. But I added the ability to find independent instructions. So I added two orange boxes and two yellow boxes. I'm looking for two instructions here that I can run in parallel. And notice that I found it in my instruction stream on the right. Throw away superscalar from your head. Let's go back to one instruction per clock. That instruction could be a vector instruction. Now notice that I drew a vector ALU with eight wide vectors, and I changed my program to vector operations. The instructions are vector. I've got a core, does one instruction per clock. It runs one thread and only one thread at a time, and that operation is vector. Now I can combine the two ideas that I just told you about. I can say, you know what? I want a superscalar processor, but instead of two uh, scalar ALUs, I'm going to have one vector and one scalar. So this is a processor that runs one thread of control, one P thread, one process. It looks automatically to try and find parallel work, parallel instructions. And if those parallel instructions happen to be one regular scalar op and one vector op, it can run them at the same time, because that's all the capability I have. I only have one regular scalar ALU, one vector ALU. Notice that it found it in this program. There's two lines that are highlighted. Those are independent instructions. Now, coming to your question, I can go back to my simple processor. One, I got rid of the vector, got rid of the superscalar. But instead, I can give it the capability to run two thread, to interleave two threads. So now I have two blue boxes. And notice that I'm supplying this processor now with two threads of control, instruction stream one and instruction stream zero. But I only have the ability to execute one of these instructions at once. I only have one orange box and one yellow box. So this processor is going to pick. It's got a little scheduler in it. It's going to choose every clock cycle. I'm going to run one instruction from one of my threads. In this case, it happened to choose instruction stream 0. So this is a dual threaded processor. I can keep that dual threading and add back in my superscalar and vector. Now I have a processor that can run two instructions per clock. And this particular design happens to choose one of the threads and find a mixture of scalar and vector instructions from that thread and run them. So now I have one thread running at a time, but two instructions from that thread. Again, single one core processor, two threads of control on that chip. Of course, everything I do here, I can, I can start scaling up. So how about we go to four threads? Now there's four blue boxes. Now we're starting to get you know, towards GPU land, four threads at a time. Now all of a sudden, my processor is just looking at its four threads and picking two instructions from any of the threads that are available to run and running those. Happen to choose instruction stream 0 and instruction stream 3. We can always go multi-core. So I'm going to take everything you have on the screen right now and double it with two cores. Now I have a chip that can run eight threads concurrently 
And each core every clock picks two instructions from its pool of four threads to figure, uh, to figure out what to do. Core zero happened to choose one instruction from instruction stream zero and one instruction from instruction stream three. Core one happened to choose two instructions from instruction stream six. So what I'm drawing here is not that exotic. I'm now gonna take this fake thing and replace it with the block diagram, the full block diagram of something like a modern Intel processor. Two threads of control, Intel likes to call that hyperthreading, can issue up to six instructions per clock in, in superscalar, provided that it finds a mixture of up to four scalar instructions and up to three vector instructions. So hyperthreading gives this core the ability to find more instructions to fill up all of these yellow boxes. Okay. That's Intel hyperthreading. And a GPU, things are pretty similar. The only difference is that instead of programs that have vector instructions in it, on a GPU, like a CUDA program, every one of those CUDA threads is a scalar instruction stream. A GPU still has a bunch of execution contexts. They're scalar execution contexts. They have their own PC. But when those different CUDA threads or these different programs are running the same instruction, in this case, seven out of the eight programs are, the GPU will realize it and run se uh, you know, these seven out of those eight programs together at the same time on a SIMD ALU. So that's sort of putting everything together that we've hit, hit in this lecture all into one sequence. They're just concepts that you can mix and match. NVIDIA mixes and matches them very differently than Intel versus other mobile vendors. But um, hopefully that sort of helps with uh, uh, the mental model thinking. Uh, okay, so let me look at some other questions. Uh, so this question at the top, actually, so maybe we'll give this two or three more minutes. And, and unfortunately, I can't get to everybody's questions because I need to, to go to a, a meeting soon. But uh, um, the biggest, what is the biggest development from what I'm talking about here? Because what I'm talking about here is, is stuff that really happened in the, in the aughts. That's when we really changed to building processors with all these primitives. The biggest change in hardware design, in my opinion, these days is that what I'm talking about here as programmable chips are no longer efficient enough for the types of things that are driving computing, high performance machine learning, video, computer graphics, computer vision, all of these operations, we are building custom processors that have circuitry that is designed to accelerate those operations. So the power limits are getting so extreme that we're moving towards hardware specialization. That is like the number one major trend in, in all of uh, sort of the, the, the hardware side of computing right now, in my opinion. Um, let me see if I can get to one more. Um, oh, I see. Uh, well, I want to get to some conversation about the platform for those that are here. How much does a physical placement of the course chip? Absolutely. Remember how we talked about how it's so expensive to get data from memory? So we are bringing memory closer to the chip. If you have one of these big chips, that register file, those on-chip storage uh, units have to be very close to the, your ALUs or you're going to pay for access to them in latency and in power, um, for sure. Um, okay, so I should probably stop there with the, the technical questions. I would like to address any questions of folks that uh, are interested in, in what we created here. And I see, Kurt, you had some questions about that. Uh, if you're still around, I don't know if you're still around. But feel free to step to the mic and... and uh, Oh, I'm happy to talk, talk further. So this is, by the way, this, this was built on a platform called Oye. Uh, full disclosure, I actually do, uh, I spent my summer internship this summer working with them because I thought it was such a neat gra graphics platform. Um, but Oye, you can think of as just uh, a video, uh, a rapid development platform for video related applications. So I run my class on OEA. I've run big conferences like H, uh, or we've developed big conferences like uh, high performance graphics or other graphics conferences on OEA. We've done uh, big parties. We did a big New Year's Eve party for 150 people. Um, and it is just a blank canvas. If you know a little bit about design or you can make slides in a WYSIWYG editor, you can make an OEA space by building different rooms and then just putting visual elements wherever you want in the rooms. Um, so I, I really love it because I, I often have, you know, virtual offices or one-on-one -on -one meetings or various types of events like PhD defenses or a classroom or 
office hours and stuff like that. And I just make a different OEA space specifically for every one of them. Like, so for example, in my office hours, we have the ability for people to sign up to get in line to um, you know, put in their cell phone number so I can buzz their cell phone when they get to the top of the line. Uh, it's basically like a mini 2D game engine. So I, I do highly recommend that people, people check it out because virtual doesn't have to suck. And uh, if you build your own thing for your experience, it's, it's amazing what you can, you know, how people react to the, to the difference. Oh, so you're looking, uh, so I see there's a presenter's control panel. Um, it might be a, a little bit weird here. I can, I can actually, let me, uh, let me see if I can screen share a part of my screen. Check this out. Um, so I'm going to screen share kind of a little bit like what I see here is, uh, let's see if this works. Oh no. Um, one second. Let me just screen share my whole desktop and uh, make it large for you. Um, so, so this is my my OEA environment. Sorry, it's telescoping a little bit. Um, I'm in like a uh, a director mode. So, what I actually have down here is I just created a bunch of buttons, just scriptable actions that at various parts in the lecture, I I just click. So, like for example, if I want to click on um, the map. Uh, show you the map again. We just move to the map. If I uh, want to click on different things, like like let's say we want to, well, I don't want to clear the chat, but I have all these things that I just created, and they're just scriptable actions that do certain things that I want during lecture. Um, the also the the real fun thing about oh yeah is that I can just hot edit. So now we're in the WYSIWYG editor, and if we want to do something like uh, let's make a new text box, put it down here. Um, I'm now hot editing this space while we are all in it. Um, and so it's very much like making slides, except some of the elements are audio and video feeds, and other elements can be media from around the web. So like, for example, when you were hearing the background audio, which I'll turn on again, of the murmur when we were coming into the crowd, uh, it should come on in a second. Let me know if you hear it. Yeah, there, there we go. So you can hear the background audio. I'm just piping that in from YouTube. So that's just some YouTube URL that I'm grabbing the audio from. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I, I like about OEA in that um, at any time I can, uh, you know, put a put a media element in here. So let me uh, say that. Oh, if I want to embed, give me one second. I want to embed some media. Like, here's an example of, oh, it didn't work. Shoot. Uh, I'll figure it out later. But you can, I can embed any website at any time. So that's how I do my whiteboarding is I don't reinvent the wheel with whiteboarding. I just re-embed Google Docs or my favorite whiteboarding app into this. And so I really rapidly take any productivity tools that I, I use when working with my students and, um, and then just wrap it in a video conferencing app. So I'll, uh, I'll move this off to the side so it doesn't block anybody. But but that's that's sort of OEA, and I'm I'm definitely a big a big fan um, in terms of doing what you want. 